You may be seated. Lord and God, we come before you with hearts full of joy as we celebrate your grace and goodness in worship. Be in us and among us and help us to heal, to love, to remember, and to look forward. You are our God of glory and our Lord of love. We open our hearts before you as we worship you in spirit and in truth, uniting our voices as one people, your people, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Chuck Snow, I'll be your elder, stewardship elder today. I have a question for you. Am I a good steward? Believers who care about honoring God with their lives and with their finances should be asking themselves this question regularly. We should be analyzing our financial habits and practices to determine if they reflect a pattern of biblical stewardship. Why this regular check-in? Jesus tells us that wealth is deceitful. In fact, the very deceitfulness of wealth can choke out the word in us, making us spiritually unfruitful, like the soil full of thorns, as told in Matthew 13, 22. As a result, we need to be on our guard so we're not deceived by wealth and drawn away from the full devotion to God. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, grew cold in his walk with God over time, due in large part to the wealth he had amassed. Accumulation of wealth had become so important to Solomon that though he had more than he could possibly need, he imposed a heavy burden on the people as he accumulated more and more so much so that on his death, the people pled with his son Rehoboam to ease the burden on them. He refused, and his refusal led to the division of the kingdom, as told in 1 Kings 12. And it all started with Solomon accumulation of wealth. If the wisest man who ever lived could be deceived by wealth, how much more do we need to be on our guard? Stewardship is more than giving. Unfortunately, many churches over time have equated the word stewardship with giving. They run stewardship campaigns to raise funds and pledges toward operational costs, building programs, or special projects. Because of this muddling of terms, many Christians think of the question of, am I a good steward as, Nothing more than am I giving enough, whatever enough means. But stewardship entails more than giving. Stewardship incorporates all that we do with the resources God puts in our care. That includes earning, saving, spending, and debt, as well as giving. 
So measuring our stewardship is not a matter of simply knowing how much we put in, into the offering plate. Stockholders evaluate their investments in business along the lines of three questions. Number one, does the business earn more than it costs to run? Is the value of the business growing over time? Does the business return fair dividends on my investment? Of course, God doesn't estimate our value based on numbers. He value, values us at the inestimable price of the life of his son. That said, there are some indicators that can tell us whether we're on the right track in terms of stewardship, and they correspond roughly to the three questions above. These indicators are cash flow, net worth, and generosity. Before we would dive into an explanation of how each of these items help measure our stewardship, a word of caution. Absolute numbers such as the income level or monthly giving do not give a complete picture of our stewardship. Consider the widow at the temple in Mark 12, 41 through 44. She gave a small amount compared to what others put in the treasury, and yet Jesus singled her out for her level of generosity. Why? Because in relation to her overall finances, her giving reflected lavish generosity. This isn't to say that the numbers don't matter. They do matter. They're just not the whole story. And there are no numbers that tell us we've accomplished good stewardship. Stewardship is a journey, not a destination. Like other areas of discipleship, we ought to strive to continuously grow in biblical stewardship. Scripture encourages in this, in Proverbs 27, verses 23 to 24, be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Be careful, give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. Friends, we have a, a new concern before us this week. Um, Terry Wing has shared that she has been diagnosed with stomach cancer. Um, so with that in mind, let's go to God in prayer. Holy God, you have called us to follow in the way of your risen son and to care for our neighbors, not only with words of comfort, but with acts of love. So, seeking solidarity with all humanity, we offer our prayer on behalf of the church and the world. Because God of hope, you sit and empathize with us in our great pain and our difficulties. We ask for your comforting presence as we grieve with, for those who are gone. We hope for your grace in situations that could have been better when, when we've fallen short. And we pray that your spirit of grace mends our brokenness, redeems our failures, and reconciles our hurting relationships. And we wait upon your blessing for those we know and love who require medical care, and all others who need your healing touch and peace. And we think especially of Terry after this diagnosis. Be with her. And Lord, as we strive in partnership with your spirit for the promise of your kingdom. We also acknowledge our pain and hardship, and we ask that you be present in our sufferings, faithful as you have promised, and gracious in our time of need. For our mourning, be with us. For our illnesses and injuries, be with us. 
for a recovery in our journey ahead be with us. And when you call us to new places, be with us. And for all those we leave behind, we leave them in your care. Guide us in the path of discipleship so that as you have blessed us, we may be a blessing to others, bringing the promise of the kingdom near by our words and deeds. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Rick? Before I begin the presentation of the honest, honored minister's pen, I have two questions. Did they give you a piece of paper with the words that you say? Okay, good. I don't have that piece of paper because I have a different piece of paper. The second question I have is, Jill, don't answer this one. Who here has an honored minister pen? Would you rise? Um, no, no, don't sit down. Come here. Between services, I made the decision that Eugene should be a part of this. We're going to do this on the fly. Are you going to be able to read from my iPad? I think I can, yes. I'll make the words big if I need to, uh, but I love you. You're a great guy. <laughs> I, I've, I've got trifocals as well. They're just well hidden. Yeah. Um, so um, I think... Um, I literally made this decision as I was walking over here. I apologize. So maybe if you did the liturgy of departure here and then I'll do the vows of reliefs and the prayer. Would okay. that work? Okay. We have a plan. For those of you standing in the back, I see three wonderful chairs right up here. And if we have to, I think you could feel like you were in the State of the Union address. You can stand or sit as you choose. No? Well, it was worth a try. Our church family is constantly changing. Babies are born, and it is noteworthy that they are almost always perhaps the most beautiful baby God has ever created. That was for you, Jill. <laughs> Children grow up, people commit themselves to one another, loved ones and friends among us come to the end of their lives. Individuals and families move into our community and church life Others leave us, moving away to new places, new experiences, and new opportunities. It is important and right that we recognize these times of passage, of endings, and of new beginnings. Today we share the time of farewell with Reverend Jill Fortin, who is retiring from her ministry with Cascade Christian Church after 44 years of service. She is not retiring from ministry. She still has lots of ministry to do, um, especially up at that place, sacred place, northwest of us, <laughs> along the shores of two lakes. Jill, will you join us? That may make it worse. Here, yeah. let me do this. In 1980, Cascade Christian Church called Jill Fortin to serve the church. Through 44 years and in several roles, Jill has faithfully served. I thank Cascade Christian Church, its members and friends for the love, <coughs> kindness, and support shown me these many years. I'm grateful for the ways my leadership has been accepted and for the good things we have been able to accomplish together. I ask for forgiveness for the mistakes I have made. And as I leave, I carry with me all that I've learned in this magnificent place. We receive your gratitude, offer forgiveness, and accept the fact that you now complete your call to serve as our pastor. We express our gratitude for your time among us. We too ask your forgiveness for any mistakes we have made. Your influence in our faith and faithfulness will not leave us your departure. I accept your gratitude 
and forgive you, trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to God and in God's amazing and wonderful plan. Do you, the members and friends of Cascade Christian Church, release Reverend Jill Fortin for her duties as your pastor? Do you, Jill, release this congregation from turning to you and depending on you as pastor? I do with the help of God. Let us pray together. O oh God, for remembered times when we together have shared the life of faith, we express our sincere gratitude. We thank you for the moments we have shared with Jill in worship, in learning, in service, and in Christian life. We pray that she will be aware of your Spirit's guidance as she moves into this new phase of her life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, will you join the prayer with words printed. God, whose everlasting love for all is trustworthy, Help each of us to trust the future which rests in your care. The time we were together in your name saw our laughter and our tears, our hopes and disappointments. Guide us as we hold these cherished memories, but move in new directions until that time to come when we are completely one with you and each other. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. When a good and faithful servant retires in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, it is the pension fund of the Christian Church that creates and gives this pin honoring the minister. And it is our tradition to honor that one with this pin. Mike, will you please, there's room, join us and place the honored <laughs> minister's pin on Jill's garment. <laughs> As you receive this pin, Wear it in memory of all the good and faithful ministry you have performed. Wear it while remembering that God's light always burns within you. Go now surrounded by our love and led by the promises of God, the presence of Jesus Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for Is it just my imagination or is it a little more full in here today than we're used to? I, I, I thought of pausing to give you permission to take off your jacket or sweater if you need to. I'm going to leave mine on, but I'm going to ventilate a little bit um, because uh, we, are, we are filling the room for sure. Uh, before I begin, I bring you greetings from your 33 sister congregations in the great state of Michigan, as well as your 123 cousin congregations in the states of Illinois and Wisconsin. It is an honor to represent the whole church and be with you on this day. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Gracious, eternal, and loving God, we give you thanks for the blessings of being church together. We give you thanks for ministry and care. We give you praise for the opportunity to sing your praises and offer our prayers in this place. Now, O oh God, we propose to do a bold and dangerous thing, for we seek to read and interpret your word. Be with us, O oh God, guide us, help us, protect us, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together will be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen.
In my teen years, my father was fond of sending me out the door with the advice or admonition, depending on how you choose to hear it, remember who you are and remember whose you are. Now, he wasn't trying to assert paternal ownership on me when he said whose you are, I don't think. No, I know. I know, in fact, what he was saying to me and also said regularly to my older siblings. Yeah, I'm the baby. Get that out of your system so you know. Remember, out in the world, you represent our family and you represent the fact that you belong to Jesus Christ. In the world, you represent your faith. So as you go to these places, sorry, I just realized I closed my scripture copy too soon. Go knowing that you represent something and live that way. Paul is admonishing the Christians in Corinth to live in a way that they understand what they represent, that they have an identity. I will be reading from a contemporary English version. For those of you who brought your Bibles, this will be a little different. For those of you using pew Bibles, it will be a little different. But as my dear friend Andy often says, you should never use a pew Bible because using someone else's Bible is like borrowing someone's underwear. You just don't do it. So bring your own. <laughs> You didn't know you were going to get that in church today. But fun fact, first service didn't get that one. So thanks for being the later arrivals. You got a bonus. I will not read all that I published. I changed my mind after publication date, but uh, beginning with the first verse of the third chapter of 1 Corinthians in the contemporary English. My friends, you are acting like the people of this world. That's why I could not speak to you as spiritual people. You are like babies as far as your faith is concerned. So I had to treat you like babies and feed you milk. You could not take solid food. And you still cannot because you are not yet spiritual. You are jealous and argue with each other. This proves you are not spiritual and you are acting like people of this world. Some of you say, this is the part I chose this for. So listen extra well. Some of you say you follow me and others claim to follow Apollos. Isn't that how ordinary people behave? Apollos and I are merely servants who helped you to have faith. It was the Lord who made it all happen. I planted the seeds, Apollos watered them, but God made them sprout and grow. What matters isn't those who planted or watered, but God who made the plants grow. The one who plants is just as important as the one who waters, and each one will be paid for what they do. Apollos and I work together for God, and you are God's garden and God's building. God treated me with undeserved grace and let me become an expert builder. I laid a foundation on which others have built. But we must each be careful how we build, because Christ is the only foundation. I'm going to end there at 12 and spare you the other 26 verses or whatever it is, 21. See, you're supposed to like me better already because <laughs> I spared you all that extra reading. Paul is writing to a very divided church. Ironically, in 1 Corinthians, this isn't the first time that he mentions Paul planted and Apollos watered. This is actually the second time it comes up in the book. He starts with it, you know, after the nice platitudes and sentences and salutations that Paul always starts a letter with, you know, those four, five, six, seven, eight paragraphs and three sentences. That was for the preachers in the room. And Paul then launches right in. Why are you fighting with each other? You belong to Christ. You are one body in Christ. It does not pay to express loyalty to one servant or another because Christ is not divided. 
We know something about division in the United States of America. Many of you, maybe not all, yeah, I'm looking at you, remember the United States of America on September 12th of 2001. When we were more united than perhaps we had ever been. In our reds and blues and various shades of purple that we have found ourselves in and divide ourselves into now, there was a time, ask the older people, that we all were one. Friends, when church is at its best, it is that way. When we are one, when we are united, when we are unified in our following of Christ, wonderful, amazing things happen. Fun fact about Christ, while the subject he talked about most was arguably money, and that's been well covered, thank you, the, the elders have held well with me today. The word or terminology he used most were the words that define as love. Christ spoke love into every room he entered. I know somebody else that spoke a whole lot of love. You know, in one of my first conversations with Jill, she reminded me of my father's admonitions, not directly, but in her own way, because she said to me, I weigh everything against, is it good for Christ, Cascade Christian Church, and is it good for the cause of Jesus Christ? Remembering whose you are and who you are as a body of believers. If we could all weigh the decisions of our lives on that scale of love and care, how much better a world would we be in? How much better in America? And yet, we struggle. We have moments of emotion and difficulty and challenge and division. And we know something of that too. When I started preparing for this day a long time ago, not that long ago, a couple of months ago, my ideas and my reality were not the same. We weren't in a place that we are today. And that is frustrating and yet has opportunity. When I look at Jill's time of ministry, and for that matter, when I look at Jill, I think it can't possibly have been 44 years. What were you, eight? <laughs> Aren't there child labor laws in Michigan? I'm editing right now. Can you see it? I was trying to decide if I was going to say, Mike helps convince me. I think I shouldn't. But he's got a good sense of humor, and all is well. And when we have these spirits of division and difficulty, it is imperative that we pause, that we remind ourselves who we are and whose we are, that we are children of the love of God through Jesus Christ, and together we are a church that shares that love. It's not always easy, but love has a way of binding us together. The story I'm going to tell you is not my own. I inherited it from a friend who lived this period with a congregation, a little church outside of San Antonio, Texas. And the Johnson family, who were prominent members and their two young children, were coming home on a Friday night from a family outing. As they drove through the intersection, the driver ran the red light, T-boned the car, and the brunt of the accident hit on the back left quarter of the car. That's where little Amy sat in her preferred seat because, right, we all have assigned seats in the car and the school bus and the van and various other things. 
And while all of the Johnsons were able to walk away, Amy's left hand was caught in the wreckage, and it was not able to be saved. The church did what church does. They rallied around the Johnsons. There was not a meal that needed to be prepared. Hospital visitations happened to an overwhelming level. Uh, everything was taken care of. Their younger child was made it to school, clean, dressed, and perhaps better so than... No, we're not going to go there. And the church prepared. The church prepared because they knew the Johnsons would one day be able to return to church. And they practiced things. They practiced things like, would somebody hold out their left hand from, uh, towards the front, ideally? Thanks, Jill. Like not doing this. They practiced what to say, what not to say. And oh, did that Sunday school class practice. You know the ones. And the day came, the Johnsons are coming back. There was excitement in the church. There was thrilled uh, exuberance. The Johnsons put on their Sunday best. This was an era where that was commonplace. Amy draped a little sweater over her arm to feel a little less conspicuous. And they came to church. And everything was glorious except for the fact that Mrs. Smith, the Sunday school teacher, had fallen ill the night before. And so they needed the substitute. So out they trucked Gladys. You know Gladys, she's taught every Sunday school age there is. She has been around and she knows the ropes. She can do David and Goliath flawlessly without opening a book and keep children completely captivated. And yet, the children didn't ask enough questions that day. And so, the lesson went 40 minutes instead of the requisite 50 minutes. And Gladys knew that you don't dare let the children out after 40 minutes because they'll run down the hall into the willing workers class and steal the donuts. <laughs> and the donuts must be protected. So Gladys, being the veteran that she was, immediately said, okay, kids, let's get in a circle. We're going to play a little game. We're going to build a church. So take your hands and put them together. And, and she knew. But Johnny, it's always Johnny. I will never know this child's real name. While the story was given to me, I, it, it, he's always called Johnny. Who's, who's here named John? Don't you just hate that it's always Johnny? <laughs> um, Johnny, who they'd prepared extra hard, got up, and Gladys' look of panic went to sheer, sheer terror. But Johnny reached out with his left hand and said, Here, Amy, I'll build a church with you. When there is strife, when there is division, when there is difficulty, we are called more than ever to reach out across our aisles, across our difficulties, across our differences, and remember that it is Jesus Christ that drives us to reach out and build a church together. On that day, the angels sang a little louder, and they all probably learned what Jill has been teaching us for 44 years. Everything is built on the love of Christ. And if it's good for Christ, it is good. Remember who you are. You are Cascade Christian Church, a great witness for the faith in Jesus Christ. Remember whose you are, not Jill's or Ray's or Gail's or Stephen's or any of the others. See, you notice I didn't do the poll I did in the first service because I was afraid there might be someone raise their hand. I'm playing with you all now and that wasn't fair of me. In the first service I asked who was here on day one. <laughs> we weren't. But there is one who could raise their nail-scarred hand. For Christ has been here, 
is here and will continue to be here. Church, love answers all. Give and share the love. Reach across those aisles. And let's build a church together for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Luckily, the sun's coming through. Jesus <clears throat> invites you to join him, just as he invited the 12 at the Last Supper. And I want to speak to the people who are receiving this message via streaming. We'd like to have you join us as well. There will be uh, enough time to get your elements as we distribute them here. So, listen up. He held his breath. He held his bread, he blessed it, and basically said to them, this is me, this is me, I am the bread. Hold me in your heart, and in your mind, and in your soul, and in your belly. And he took a cup, and he thanked God for it, and passed it to them, again inviting them to be part of him even as he prepared to give his life for many, 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 including you and me, though perfect, we will never be. As we proceed towards communion, let us remember him in our communion hymn, number 461, titled In Remembrance. By the way, my name is Armand Aronson. I'm your communion elder this morning. Our words of institution, I'm going to read from Mark 14, 22 to 25. So this is the actual words of Jesus. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, 
When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said, This is my blood, the covenant of which is poured out for many. And he said to them, Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let us pray, and if the elders and if Chuck and the deacons will come forward as I pray, please. O oh, good and gracious God, we come to you with great thanks. You have created the heavens and the earth, and they are good. You have created life and love, and they are good. From before the beginning, you planned that the Messiah would come to provide firsthand perspective on your love for us, and your purposes for us in this world, and your provision for us in the glorious time to come. We ask your blessing, Lord, on these elements we share today. We give thanks as we remember Jesus in the elements of communion. We give thanks that Jesus gave his life, that we might join our triune God, three in one, now and forevermore. We give thanks, God, that you have chosen people throughout the ages to bring your word and your love to all who have ears and all who would listen. And we especially give thanks that Jesus has chosen to work so closely and with and through Jill Fortin. She has done so well and has been such a good and faithful servant. She has prayed, she has preached, she has comforted, and she has done quite a bit of holy camp stuff up there at Crystal. She has been so effective here at Cascade Christian Church. She speaks through her actions even more than her words. Jill has shown us how to be Christians. And Lord, I ask that in your good time, maybe even some today, that you would allow her to see how the love for Jesus is rippling through generations of people. Faith is caught more than taught. And so many of us have caught a glimpse of eternal faith from her. Lord, we give thanks to you, our great and gracious God, for this communion, for Jesus, and for Jill. Amen. Amen.
this is going to sound extra weird. When you're used to hearing the same voice say the same words for so long, it sounds funny when it comes from another voice. This is the moment, a moment of decision, a moment where we publicly profess that if we have found a place of service, of witness, of care, and compassion in Cascade Christian Church and want to formally become a member of this congregation, you are invited to come and be received. If you have found that even more important decision, that decision that you want to confess your faith in Christ and declare before God and the world that you believe and wish to be baptized. We invite you to come and be received. If you need to reaffirm your faith, if you need some prayer, this is the time. Will you come as we stand together and sing our invitation to discipleship, Be Thou My Vision? Jill, will you join me?
I want to thank all of you for being here today. I have had some um, oh my goodness moments as I have seen friends from college, Holden Hall, go green, go white, Sparty on. Um, friends from camp, get those elbows off the table. You know, I just look around and I, I see my life here. Some of you, I knew you when you were little kids and you're here with your kids. We've traveled together, we've done some things, we've served God, we've loved, we've praised, we've cried. We've had weddings, funerals, baptisms, births, and everything in between. And it has been a privilege and an honor to serve as your pastor. I wanna thank you for all of the ways we've been able to walk this journey together. Thank you for being so kind to me and my family. Thank you for your generosity, your forgiveness, your faithfulness. I'm so proud of this church, how together we didn't miss a beat when COVID closed the church, kept going. Learned a whole lot of new technology, kept going. So proud of the church when we turned 150 years young and celebrated for a whole year. And my pride in this church really says not so much I'm proud of you. What I'm proud of is how you collectively love and serve Jesus Christ and continue to build his kingdom here. And I know that God has a bright future for this church. And I want to say a thank you to every person who is and was and will be leaders here in this church. I encourage you to lead with love. Trust in the movement of the Holy Spirit and support one another, because friends, that's what a church family does. Thank you for letting me serve here. This has truly been the best job in the world. And I leave with the heart full of love and gratitude. And as I leave, I wanna give one more word of thanks, and that is to my husband, Mike. Kurt, you might remember 10 days after I got married, I took off on a great big bus and a bunch of us went to New York City. Kathy, Laura, you might remember that. He put up with that kind of thing like, I'll see you later, but I'm gone for the church now. Mike, thank you so much for all of the ways you've been kind and compassionate and supportive. All the times when it was, I'm working tonight, get your own dinner. All the time the cookies I baked were not for you, but for the church. <laughs> I just could not have a better helpmate. So, Mike. <laughs> Mike and I both thank you. You've been our home, you've been our family, you've been the village where we have raised our son, Max. We'll never forget you, and while this is a parting, it's not a forever goodbye, because when friends are friends in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're friends, they're family, forever. Mike and I have had a saying through his cancer time and through now, um, forward, onward. I'm gonna tell you that too. Walk onward, forward with Jesus Christ. Because you know right behind you, his goodness and mercy are following you every day of your life. The song that Molly and Lisa are about to sing is very meaningful for me, because whenever I hear it, I think of you. Thank you.
The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and the children and the children and the children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you, and within you. He is with you, He is with you, in the morning, in the evening, in the coming, and your going, in your weeping, and rejoicing. He is for you, 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 He is for you. For you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you, he is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, 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 he is for you. For you, he's for you. received a benediction. So I'm redundancy at this point. I'm also noticing that it's 10 minutes after 12 and there's another couple of hundred people waiting in Centennial Hall. They probably took all the good seats <laughs> and yet they're expecting the guest of honor. I thank you for indulging me on this day. I must jump in the car and go to the general board of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the United States and Canada. So I will be scurrying out the door. I don't get to enjoy the cake, the punch, and any surprises that may be coming. But allow me one last word of benediction. Go from this place receiving and sharing the love of God through Jesus Christ, reaching out to one another, and building the church God calls us to be.
Amen.